Uh, greetings, greetings all. Joseph Kursky here. Let me ask you a few questions. Oh, many thanks. At what moment in your life did you decide to go into geospatial? At what moment did you decide, these are my people? Maybe a, a teacher, a professor, a friend, a family member helped you see a future vision of yourself. Maybe a field trip, a book, a, a special place in your neighborhood that only you knew about sparked your love for the earth and made you want to protect it. In my case, I remember reading The Last Great Auk every year when I was a kid. And I would get to 1844 and I knew the last of those great auks would be killed off of that island and off of Iceland. And I said, how can we let this happen? And then what can I do about it? Maybe you had that experience. Perhaps holding the family road atlas in your lap filled you with a thirst for adventure. Maybe as you learn more about the challenges facing our world and your love for people and places made you decide, I will make a positive difference. I'm asking you to think about your own story this morning in the next three hours that we have together. Just kidding, we don't have three hours. Just wanted to make sure you were on your toes. Because I want you to consider two things. One, the unique gifts that you bring to your organization, nonprofit, government, private industry, academia, et cetera. Number two, I want you to practice articulating why you're doing what you're doing and why it matters. Because now more than ever, people need to hear that message, right? As we're faced with global issues and challenges that increasingly affect our everyday lives. In my case, as Jennifer mentioned, I have roots in government, nonprofit, academia, and private industry. I love the Wisconsin geospatial community, and I look forward to further collaborative efforts with you all. I want to, in the next few moments, salute you, encourage you, connect you, and also challenge you. So as we think about our own stories and why we're in this place at this time, this was my backyard where I, where I grew up. I, I didn't have a lawn, I had a parking lot. So my folks owned a motel in Grand Junction after I moved there from 5258 North 90th Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53225. It's amazing how we remember those things, right? And the places, we're very space and place bound, aren't we folks? But my folks moved us to Grand Junction, Colorado, the land of the Ute Mountain Utes, when I was a kid. And I think meeting people from all over the world and hearing their stories that would stay at our motel. By the way, have you ever stayed at a place where you know that there's someone living behind the front office? That was the kind of place that we owned. We had an apartment behind the front office of the motel. But that was what sparked my love for people and places. I also drew maps as a kid. It would be nice to, to minimize this, wouldn't it? We don't need that. Gracious. Oh, heavens. Anyway, the point is, what did you do that was geeky when you were a kid that nobody else liked to do? In my case, I drew maps on big poster board of made up places. I had railroad lines, I had docks, university campuses, etc. on my maps. I also named all my streets. And another thing that I did, thank you. Another thing that I did was I had these numbers in the margins of my maps. What are those numbers? It might be a little hard for you to see in the back. The 3500 North block, the 4200 North block, a seven blocks north of the 3500 North block. Address ranges. What kid cares about address ranges? What kid knows about address ranges? Think about the unique things that you did and like to do that maybe nobody else likes to do. Embrace those, make them a part of your story is one of my encouraging words for you all today. I also wanted to get the angle just right on all the photographs that I took as a kid. I would go up into office buildings, excuse me, can I take a picture out of your window because I know the angle is gonna be just right to get this canyon or mountain or, or alleyway. I was a big fan and still am of ordinary places. I also 
found far away radio stations. Wow, we could pick up all the way from Juarez, Mexico. We could get KOMA, Oklahoma City, WLS, Chicago, all the way into Grand Junction, Colorado. So I've been involved with GIS and education for quite some time. The first multi-day GIS education workshop I taught for K-12 teachers was in 2010. I was a bit nervous, all online, no desktop software. Is this gonna work? Please let it work. It worked, three days. We had something then called arcgisonline.com. Maybe some of you remember, nationalatlas.gov, et cetera. So we would use those web-based tools. We also had something called Arc Web Explorer from Esri. Arc Web Explorer. We also had something called Arc Explorer Web. There were two completely separate products. I'll just leave that with you all. Now you have educational leaders right here in Wisconsin. There's Julio Rivera at Carroll University. So when I arrived here on Sunday, you'll be pleased. The first thing I did when I got out of the airport was I hiked at the UW Arboretum. Yes, beautiful place. And then I went to UWM and I went to the AGS map library. Oh my gosh, I wanna live there. You know, the Von Humboldt 1805 map is in there. You need to make a pilgrimage if you haven't been there. It's a, it's a gem. And then I went to Carroll University. Guess what? There are four or five business faculty that are keen on using location analytics in business. So the dual mission of the team that I'm on, the ESRI education team, is completely dedicated to education. Primary, secondary, university, tribal college, community college, technical college, libraries, and museums. And our dual mission is twofold. The deeper implementation of geospatial technology. It's a platform. It's not, hey, Joseph, I'm teaching ArcGIS Pro 3.0. That's great, I'll say. But there's a higher, more noble goal. The higher, more noble goal is to think spatially and critically and help those students to be positive change agents on the landscape in their future workplace. The tools change, right? The tools evolve. The goal is never to teach GIS. The goal is to, as you folks are fostering, understanding something in a deeper, richer way. That's the higher, more noble goal. Can I get an amen? Right, that's the higher, more noble goal. Anyway, so the deeper implementation of GIS, it's a platform, right? The field data collection, the spatial analysis tools, the communication with story maps and dashboards, et cetera. And then the other part of the mission is the broader implementation of GIS. In other words, GIS is, it's too important just to be in one or two disciplines on a campus, okay? It needs to be beyond geo and viro. As Jennifer mentioned, I love geography. What's not to love? But it needs to be in data science, business, sociology. And the folks at Carroll are in business, teaching supply chain, target marketing, risk assessment, insurance, real estate. That's all spatial. Just like the UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, all those things are spatial. Hence, geospatial technology. So you've got some real leaders right here in the state. Then I went to UW-Madison and hung out with Howard and got to meet some wonderful students and faculty, and it's been gr a grand week. So thanks for inviting me, folks. So that's one of my, the things that I do. I also have a video. Jennifer mentioned my 5,000 videos. I have a video called Swimming to Wisconsin, because I was in Minnesota at a GIS education meeting right on the St. Croix, and I swam to Wisconsin. Oh, gosh. What's not to love? I've been to some hallowed grounds for sure. How many people go to Lambeau Field in a tie? Well, that's me, okay. I've also uh, been, oh, look at this, 46 degrees north, 92 west, out in the woods there, up by Hayward, yeah, in my tie, okay. Now, let me ask you this, folks, who's a leader here? I would submit that you're all leaders. You're all leaders in your organization. There are people in this world that, dream about making a positive difference in the world, right? There are people that, that want to make a difference. You folks are making a difference. You're building the national spatial data infrastructure bit by bit, right? The parcels, the rivers, the transportation lines, the utility lines, everything else that you're mapping and analyzing, helping, to peop helping people see the world in new ways and to solve problems and to build resiliency, sustainability, right? Because we all have these similar goals. We wanna see a more equitable, resilient, sustainable world. That's what we want to see in society, right, folks? And you folks are doing just that. So I love this community, and I appreciate the invitation. Look forward to further chats with you all. 
Now, geotechnologies, unlike articles that came out in the 1990s, some of you remember the 1990s, said that you know, geotechnology is not going to be a thing by the 2020s. It's going to be so ingrained in government agencies, et cetera, that everybody's going to be embracing geospatial technology. In some, in some ways, that's true, right? We have county governments, right, where the assessors, the parks and rec, the transportation, they're all using geotechnologies to some degree. On the other hand, spatial is a bit special still. We still have our community get together. Why? Because we have a unique perspective on the world. Now, Dr. Lewis talked about this, and so did Bill Quackenbush the other day, about the holistic perspectives on the world. That's what we're fostering, right, this community. You want to see how the lithosphere is connected to the hydrosphere, is connected to the atmosphere, is connected to the anthroposphere, right? the human sphere. There's 8 billion humans on the planet. There's going to be 10 billion humans at some point, and 5.2 5 billion, 5 billion of those are going to be in cities. How are we going to feed those people? How are we going to provide water? We've got some pressing challenges, but I'm very encouraged by you folks. We've got good people, good tools, making a positive difference. So... Over the last three years, right, right we we've, we've have felt more challenged than ever before. We have been, we've felt very empowered, but we also feel quite challenged. I think a couple of years ago, people wondered, why does ESRI, for example, have a health team? Why do we have a health team? I don't think they wonder about that anymore, right? Health, spatial technology, spatial thinking, it's, it's fundamental to solving health challenges and so many more challenges. But again, I'm very encouraged. You folks are building the national spatial data infrastructure. And you're not just building the data, but the metadata. I never metadata I didn't like. Okay, um, the framework, the standards, the partnerships, you're building the community. You've got a vibrant, wonderful community. And I'll just say this. I, as Jennifer very kindly mentioned, visit about 35 campuses a year, face-to-face, -face, as well as lots of online support. I also visit a lot of state and also international GIS communities. So last year at the Euro Geo Conference in Greece, I've been to Oklahoma, Florida uh, in the last year, et cetera. This community is very highly respected. So I'm not saying that to every single state group, but you are very highly respected and I salute you. You're revolutionary. I wrote a book called Interpreting Our World that basically my mom and I read. I mean, that, those are the only people that, because it's interdisciplinary, it crosses boundaries. GIS is by its nature, a disruptive technology. It breaks down barriers in governments, in academia. I met Ed Boswell the other day at UW-Madison. Ed's teaching geo design. Ed is all on fire about getting geospatial technology in lots of different departments together with Howard and others on campus. It, it just warms the heartstrings. Let me just have a moment. It does, it, it brings geo tears, okay? Now, I'm on the education team and I'd like to encourage you a little bit about uh, some ed educational aspects to GIS. What should we be teaching? How should we be teaching this? Why should you care, GIS professionals, that you are about education? You've got kids, you know kids, you know people with kids, you've got an alma mater, you care about your future employees, You've got a neighborhood school. You've got an after-school club, et cetera. You've got connections to what happens in education. So those are just a few reasons. How can you connect and why should you care about what's happening in GIS education? So um, education, as you know, just like many other sectors of society are in massive amounts of change and disruption. They're always trying to reinvent themselves about how do we be relevant going forward up until 2030 and beyond, et cetera. And one of the things that I'm trying to encourage educators to do is to think creatively in this disruptive time about what you offer, who you offer it to, and the value that spatial thinking and geotechnologies bring to a wide variety of disciplines across academia and therefore in society. Now, there are lots of lists out there on the web. The five coolest places to visit in Wisconsin before you die. The five coolest bands. Did you have arguments with your high school friends the, about the coolest band? And you could never win the argument, right? But I would just submit to you all that these are five forces for us to chew on in the next few moments. I know these are a little bit tiny, these, uh, these hexagons, but geo-awareness is at an all-time high. The things that you and I care about, water, energy, sustainable development, and so on, they're topics of conversation that I hear in 
stairwells, airport shuttles, et cetera. People are aware that these issues are serious. They don't always connect it to geospatial. And that's where you can come in with your elevator speech that I'll talk about in a moment, have that articulated elevator speech down. And that's encouraging though. Geo-enablement, people are aware not only of these issues, but they're enabled to use some pieces of geotechnology, right? How many of you have a fitness app? Okay, you're recording your walks and your runs and your cycle rides. Okay, how many of you have used a ride share? How many of you have something to eat today uh, or yesterday? Supply chain management, right? Uh, that, the electricity in this room, it's all enabled by geospatial technology, right? It's all around us. It's sort of like an elevator. You push buttons and it, you just expect it to work and you don't really think about the technology behind the scenes, but that's what geospatial is to me. It's behind the scenes, but people are enabled to use pieces of it now as never before. In the past, it was sort of like this. Hey, Jennifer, you wanna learn geospatial technology? Here's a big set of manuals. And now you go learn this stuff. And by the way, you'll have to put your regular career on hold as county GIS guru or wildlife biologist, right? You had to sort of decide, I'm gonna be a GIS analyst or I'm gonna do my, what I went, you know, what I really desire to do. Now, I'm not gonna say it's easy, right? The world is a complex place, right? We've got natural hazards happening, 8 billion humans affecting the planet. So GIS is always going to be inherently complex because the world is complex and we're trying to figure out the world and all of its complexity. However, I think you would agree with me that it is much more approachable than ever before, right? You can use Ian Muehlinghaus, Dr. Muehlinghaus here. Hey, UW grad, Woo, professor from UW, now working at ESRI, very cool. So we've got a lot of people from Wisconsin actually at, at ESRI. And the point is you can use ArcGIS Insights to teach economics, business, et cetera approachable tools or use it in your own workplace. Lots of tools like that. So it's much more approachable than it was ever before, than, than in, in the clunky old days of GIS. GIS. So the geotechnologies have been, having advented into this cloud-based software as a service environment is huge. It's even better than having Dropbox or Google Drive for sharing documents with colleagues. It's even better than having your music in the cloud. So you can access ABBA's greatest hits anytime, anywhere. ABBA was a band, okay? The point is, it's even better than that. Having geotechnologies in the cloud is a, a huge paradigm shift. Citizen science goes back to the 19th century at least. People collecting data in the field with clipboards, with notepads, et cetera. And now being able to map that, for example, with survey one, two, three instantly, tree species, water quality, et cetera. That, that is huge also. And then storytelling, this whole presentation is I tweeted it out a while back. Ooh, um, right here. So on my Twitter feed with basically just, you know, a couple people look at. But if you want to look at it, I've got some things in this story map that I'm going to skip. But I wanted to put it in there because you're the Wisconsin GIS community and you deserve to have a, a lot of stuff in there. So I'm going to skip some things, but on the job outlook and so on and so forth, so you're welcome to, to look at that on your own, okay? So that being said, let's continue with our discussion. I would also like to throw out these just for us to chew on, little bite-sized mini gluten-free pieces of uh, GIS trends for you to chew on here in the next few moments. I would, I would argue that we live in a 3D world. It makes sense that we've got 3D analytics. We've had 3D visualization for quite some time. Some of you may remember in grad school or as an undergraduate, one of the things to do in class was the last day of the semester, we're gonna fly through our data. Ooh, right? Elevation, population change, et cetera. That was a big deal. We prayed the graphics card wouldn't crash. Now we've got 3D analytics, which absolutely makes sense that we had to have. And it took a while to get there. But, and then also it's interesting to me, the, this, this gradual touching between the people are mapping outside spaces, us and our colleagues, and the people mapping inside spaces, some of you as well, the CAD, BIM, architecture, engineering, and construction worlds. They're not completely joined, but there's tools that merge the ArcGIS uh, Urban, uh, ArcGIS Indoors, and others, right? That, that actually have this touching, which is good because if we're gonna develop some sort of resiliency plan for a campus or a town, we've gotta have the interior spaces at least some of them, and the exterior spaces in some, the same system. So that makes sense. And then finally, well, not finally, but real-time data, people wanna map things now or as near real-time as possible, right? So having these feeds of 
traffic cams, wildfire perimeters, stream gauges is again, a huge leap forward, the internet of things. And the sensor network of, again, billions of humans collecting data as well. The enterprise part, what I mean by that is, in the past it was sort of, oh, you need some GIS or, or spatial data, uh, go see those people down the hall and you know to the right. They're kind of nerdy and they're geeky, but they're nice people, go talk to them. And now more and more people in an organization, right, are empowered to use at least some aspects of geospatial technology. And artificial intelligence and machine learning. As geospatial technology has evolved into a mainstream IT sort of architecture and not so niche and specialized like it was in the past, it's now connected to other mainstream IT trends. And I would just highly advocate that we think carefully and thoughtfully about the ethics of some of those tools. It, location technologies are inherently personal. So I want us to make wise decisions going forward. It, to that point, I have, I know this sounds super boring. Oh, Joseph's data blog. I can't even contain my excitement, you know, but, but a colleague and I wrote a book called The GIS Guide to Public Domain Data. And we wanted to keep the conversation going after the book was published. So every week, you've all have, you all have a device, you can look up spatial reserves. Every week we write about three things. Where do I find spatial data? How do I know if it's any good? And then societal issues, copyright, ethics. You have a lot of power at your fingertips with geospatial technology, right? And you can share the maps and apps with a wider variety of people than ever before. Therefore, you need to be very careful about the symbology that you use, the projection that you use, et cetera, the classification that you use, and so on, right? So with great power comes great responsibility, and you folks have that at your fingertips, and so does everybody else that's empowered to use geospatial. So that's what this is all about. This, I want people to be critical of data. Hey, within a few moments, I could have an ArcGIS Online map with 10 layers in it, and I could be analyzing those. Do you know where all those layers came from? How often it was updated? Who created it? What scale was it created at? And so on. And oftentimes I go behind people that are doing exactly that and they'll say, no, I have no idea. Maybe you better find out. Okay, so be critical of the data. Maps have this sort of air of authenticity. They look authoritative. Anybody can create a map and publish it and share it. So be critical of data, including mapped data. Okay, let's continue. How are folks doing? You and me making maps. Sometimes it feels like you and me making maps. That was if Helen Reddy had been singing about maps. Some of you are like, who's Helen Reddy? The point is, let's continue on. Okay, we're in phase two of GIS. We used to be able to do this kind of thing. What I call phase one is we've got traffic accidents in a county. We, we had attributes on them. We still have attributes on them. We could do a, we can make a graduated symbol map or a graduated color map, right, of all these accidents, a very serious issue. Now, I think we're in phase two of GIS, whereas we're, we can do things, we're, we're in, we can do things that we could never do with digital versions of our paper maps. So for example, making hex bins out of the accident data and then extruding these polygons. And as you folks are well aware, you've got a limited staff, a limited budget, a limited time to be able to do anything. And so, okay, I'm gonna focus on the consecutive hotspots. How did I get to the consecutive hotspots and being able to make my community safer? I can do that because of GIS, helping me to zero in on those consecutive hotspots where accidents have consistently occurred statistically significantly more than any other intersection in my community. That's the kind of thing that excites me about GIS. We're really seeing things in new ways. Phase two of GIS. Another thing that I wanted to have you think about is this whole idea of the elevator speech. Have that 30 second speech down because there's still, even though I talked about geo awareness, there's still this sort of, hey, why do we need you? I've got Google Maps on my phone and you gotta be able to say, this is why this position matters, right? You need to be able to articulate that. Your one minute speech, your five minute, your two hour speech because the board of directors or the county commissioners or whoever it is, is down the hall asking you. So have that ready to go. I have a bunch of elevator speeches on my video channel, Our Earth. You can use some of those for inspiration, but make them your own voice, right? Make them your own voice, absolutely. 
Also, a couple of a couple of notes here as we get into why we should care about this in education and beyond. Don't stop at the map. Oftentimes, people say, "Hey, Joseph, here's my data on my map. Here's my URL," and I'll say, "That's great." And why do I say "and"? Because you don't want to stop at the map. The map is a bridge. The map is a a stepping stone to understanding. So don't just stop at getting that data on the map. Also, don't get too attached to the tools. This is an actual high school. I took this picture. It's a doorstop now, but at some point it was. What's it? What is this? It's an old Mac. Maybe some of you have seen this in a museum. Maybe some of you had one. Now it's a doorstop. Those things were pretty expensive. So it's an expensive doorstop. But at one point it was someone's valued computer architecture, or at least a component of their computer architecture. Don't get too attached to the tools. That treasured thing that you use right now, it's probably too light to be a doorstop. It's probably gonna be a paperweight at, at some point. That's okay, the tools evolve. Nurture this tool right here. This is the most important tool of all, your spatially enabled decision-making brain. What I've always loved about GIS, let me just have a moment, okay, is the following. It has always been a thinker's tool, a thinker's tool. That's what makes it appealing. It's always been the people that make the smart decisions based on the data and the tools that we have at our fingertips, right folks? So don't get too attached to the tools. And why does that matter for education? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. I would submit to you all that there's this stool of geoliteracy with content knowledge specialized in water, energy, agriculture, whatever it is that you're, that you're passionate about. But don't lose the geographic perspective, the holistic perspective, that these spheres are connected. And also the cycles are connected, the hydrologic cycle, the carbon cycle, et cetera. We, we need people in our world that can see holistically as never before. And that's what I think one of the values that you folks bring to our world. And then the skills. It's not that this is the geotechnology skills, right? It's the skills in communication. It's the skills in spatial analytics, et cetera. Okay. Now I wanna just chat with you about the following. My, my own area of research, by the way, is, you know, I talked about what do you specialize in? Is teaching and learning with GIS. What difference does this make in a high school, in a, in a university, in a tribal college, if students are actually learning with GIS? What difference does it make in their content knowledge, skills, and their perspectives? What difference does it make in their career pathway, their community engagement, et cetera? So that's my own area of research. And there aren't that many people that are looking into this, but how and when and where should students start learning about geotechnologies? Is it appropriate? Sometimes people say, hey, Joseph, you're, you're trying to make these, these little kids in primary school use GIS? Hey, if you're teaching about ocean currents, nothing against textbooks. I've written some myself. You've used some. You've maybe written some. You're not stuck with this ocean currents map on page 300 of your textbook that is this size and it's from 1975. You've got the living atlas of the world for one thing. You've got the new ecological marine units layer and app. 10 kilometer spacing, six variables from the top of the ocean column to the bottom at 10 kilometer spacing all over the world. What a great resource. It's wonderful that you have a, my precious. It's like at your fingertips. It's amazing. And you've got the world water balance, you've got the way back imagery with, with terabyte loads of, of imagery at your fingertips and you can swipe in, across 10 years time at high resolution. You can look at coastal erosion in England. You could look at agricultural expansion in Saudi Arabia, uh, glacial retreat and change, uh, urbanization, changes in your own neighborhood or on your own campus at, at your fingertips. So for those educators, most of them are actually using GIS as an instructional tool. They're not teaching GIS in K through 12. They're using it as a tool to teach social studies, science, math, et cetera. There are some exceptions. At the university and community and technical and tribal college level, it's mostly teaching GIS and GI science. But as you know, from my broader mission of, of our education team, in conjunction with all of you, by the way, we have a little team. You can't do it alone. It's in conjunction with all of you. But the broader part of spreading GIS around academia is in business, health, et cetera. Again, as an instructional tool to get students to think spatially and critically. Uh, another thing that I wanted to mention here is 
we work with extensively with tribal colleges. So it's great that, that you've had the two previous speakers here touching on the need for this. So just to give you an example, a colleague and I created this Lakota language story map. Now, Dr. Lewis yesterday talked about, hey, what can you do? What can we do as a community? One of them is to be aware of endangered indigenous languages. So in this particular story map, it's, a, it's kind of a simple idea, but the idea was let's get the kids, in this case at the Lakota uh, Sioux uh, uh, area in South Dakota, to think about this. Blair. So, so we've got the English word, and you probably couldn't hear that very well, and the Lakota word. So river, river. Wah, wah, wah. exactly. Um, so you see what I what I'm going with here. It's a simple idea, but what I wanted to plant in people's minds was: look, story maps, multimedia. We don't do enough with audio, for one thing, and secondly, to help the students understand what the Lakota, in this case, word was for physical and cultural features on the landscape. And the third, remember I was talking about there's always a bigger, higher, more noble goal. The bigger, higher, more noble goal here was to draw attention to languages, and specifically indigenous languages, and specifically, hey, if I can do this, and the nice thing about story maps too is that all I had to do is put that audio file of my colleague speaking the Lakota words, and it knows, oh, I'm gonna, that's an audio file, I'm gonna configure a player. I didn't have to do any coding. But what I wanted to plant in people's minds was, ooh, we could have whole audio blocks of tribal elders speaking about why this place matters. So again, that was the more noble goal there. Simple idea, but I'm hoping it makes a big impact. Okay, couple of guiding points as we have about eight minutes left here. And that is, as GIS evolves, as I mentioned earlier, it becomes more powerful and yet easier to use at the same time. It should evolve in, in those two dual ways. And also, don't stop at getting your data on the map. I talked about that a few moments ago. Also, for those of you that are working with instructors and have influence on ed educational things happening, there is a, a mindset still that as an instructor, I have to create everything myself encourage people not to feel pressured to do that. At one point in the past, you probably can relate from your own educational experience, everything that you needed to know about that lesson had to be in that activity or that lab. No longer, right? You don't have to do that. Why? Because people can, A, if they get stuck geocoding or, or uh, georegistering an image or something, they'll go to a video, right? Make sure it's, it's, you know, it's, it's rigorous and so on. Or they'll look at the software documentation. Nowadays, you know, it's really a mini ebook where you've got graphics and so on and so forth. So I'm telling instructors, don't feel like you're, you have to create every single thing. I taught cartographic design in the fall. I had a point in the course where I wanted to do something with 3D voxels. I don't know anything about teaching with 3D voxels, but there's a lesson, learn.arcgis.com, that I, that I could substitute in for week number eight of the course. That met my needs. Then I could focus on things that I would add value to. Also, if instructors are going to put all those screenshots, you know what's coming next, right? They're going to be stressed that every time the software evolves, they're going to have to update these big, long labs. And I've got those too. It was hard for me to give up my 40-page going to the census.gov site and getting the boundaries and then getting the demographic data. And you know what I mean, right? We've all done that, joining. It's still a very arduous, clunky, and this is hard for me to say because I used to work at the Census Bureau. I love the data, but it's still very clunky to do that. I'm thinking and telling other people, hey, for that workflow, if you want to teach about joining, join to the Living Atlas of the World, for example. Have a data set here locally and then join it to world countries or states or counties or something like that. You can teach the same concepts in a much shorter amount of time, freeing you up to do some other things that you want to do. So... Um, I would highly encourage you to think about those things. Here's some student work ever so briefly. Story map about, hey, a high school student flying a drone for a future event on that student's campus. Did a very nice job creating a, a, a digital map of the campus. I love this one. You can take a look at it in my story map. I won't show it right now. Why are right whales dying in the Gulf of St. Lawrence? What I really like about this one, this is a middle school student. What she did at the end is she actually came up with a solution. Right? We were talking about this earlier, that GIS, we want to analyze problems, but 
come up with a solution. In this case, they were getting caught in lobster traps. And she came up with a solution at the end of her story map, which is really, really, I think, fascinating. And OK, so another thing is there are many reasons to be encouraged. I, here's a, geek, a rather geeky story map. But this story map has a little red schoolhouse. And this is just the US schools of all of the schools that actually have an ArcGIS online organization, K-12. So you've got a good community here. Are they doing anything with it? Some are. Some are doing one lesson a semester. Some are actually using this every week to teach about biomes, to teach about population change, et cetera. So that's something that you, should, you folks should be proud of because I know you're all very keen on giving back to the educational community. You're geo mentors, you've got kids, et cetera, like I said before. So that's actually quite good. At the university level, just to give you a little status update, most GIS is still in geo and viral planning programs, but that is changing, especially in health and in business. Like I was saying, Carroll University being one of your, one of the nation's standout universities and right here in Wisconsin. And then also there's some modest growth in these other areas that I've got here on this particular part of the story map. To be honest, sometimes it's agonizingly slow. I want every professor to think about the whys of where in their courses, because every one of us wants to um, affect it, change in a positive way. And every professor is wanting their students to be engaged in real world issues and actually to care. And this is one way of encouraging that. But I've got to be content with modest, slow change in some of these other areas. But some of them are actually growing fairly fast. That's good. One thing to mention in, in an, on an encouraging note is that there are more and more geospatial librarians on campuses. Those people are charged with breaking down barriers between departments, between schools on a university or even on a technical or a tribal or community college campus. So that's good. If there's a geospatial librarian, that is their job, okay? Now, let me ask you this, speaking about the job. How many of you feel 100% adequate at your job? I know this is kind of a deep sort of personal question. I was reading a book about a year ago where the author said, you know, I, I don't feel like I've quite arrived at this profession. That author's profession was songwriting. That author was Paul McCartney. It was the L through Z lyrics book. He's also got an A through a, a, a J book. But the point is, or A through K book. If Paul McCartney doesn't feel 100% adequate at being a songwriter yet, it's okay for us to have days where we don't feel quite 100% adequate at doing our job. That's why we need each other. That's why we need this community. And again, I salute this community. You folks are truly things, uh, people that uh, are making a positive difference. I love this quote from Bernstein. To accomplish great things, two things are required, a plan and not enough time. Does that feel like, okay, that's what I'm dealing with, Joseph. Yep, I can relate to that. So let me close with in the last two minutes here, the top five skills that I believe are important for you all as the Wisconsin GIS geospatial community going forward. First of all, be curious, don't lose that. I get concerned sometimes that as a society, we care more about information than wonder, wonder. So when you're out there in the field, this is a unique part of the world and we've got this unique planet, as you know, in the, in the universe. So treasure it, try to, it, you folks are doing all you can to protect it, but be curious about why does this, why is this related to this variable related to this? Is this variable related to this one over here? That leads to tenacity, right? Final, 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 Friday night dot APRX, <laughs> right? Be tenacious. Asking good questions is a part of this geographic inquiry process. I mentioned the Spatial Reserves data blog as one resource, but be critical of data and know how to work with it. That's one of the advantages of GIS. And along with that, understand the ethical implications of what you are doing. Okay, I've got some articles about that if you want to read that. Know your geographic and geospatial technical foundations. When I'm working with the business school, do I front load it with, hey, you need to know about geodatabases and you need to know about uh, shape files and, and uh, uh, serving data and tiles? No, because what would they say? Hey, Joseph, I don't have time for this. I'm teaching supply chain. Thank you very much. I don't want anything to do with GIS. No, I go in there and saying, okay, let's do some vehicle routing. Let's do some target marketing. Let's look at business analyst web. You've got all this rich data about who has more than two dogs and two cats? Who has more than three dogs and two cats? I mean, the granularity of the data inside Business Analyst Web is amazing. 
So I, sure, if they're making a map of routing around the Arctic Ocean, at some point I'll say, you know, you really need to think about, there's something called the polar projection, okay? So there's ways to sprinkle in the things that you and I care about, but I first go with what they wanna do. Now, I think that we're really good at a community uh, of who can I mentor, like I talked about before, but I just encourage you about the following. Who can I connect with to receive mentorship? I think we're oftentimes a bit hesitant to ask others, hey, could I get your advice on something? So I just encourage you there. The geospatial technology competency model is a good one to think about where are your gaps and how can you fill those, especially the, the bottom part of the pyramid. Am I organized? Am I ethical? Can I deal with data? Those personal competencies. Adaptability, be flexible, be willing to go international. If you can't do that at some point uh, with a conference or uh, working with a, a group from somewhere else in the, in the world, go outside of your disciplinary comfort zone. If you're a water person, work with the ag people or work with the city planner or you know what I mean? So it, it stretches you. So at a recent geography conference, I went to the social work track. I met some new people. I learned about their methods. Wonderful growth for me. Also read. Now, lastly, I think that this diagram is really quite good. Am I at the center of this every day at work? No, but think about what you're good at, what the world needs, what you can be paid for, and what you love to do. This Ikigai diagram from the Japanese, it's really a, a good one to come back to. How centered are you in this day to day? And finally, have good communication. I mentioned the elevator speech, Nurture those communication skills. Again, find someone to partner with and practice, practice articulating those messages to your, to your colleagues. Folks, I really believe that this decade will be an exciting one. It already is so far in many ways, uh, but exciting in terms of you making positive change happen in your communities, on the landscape, and you have a key role. And again, the goal, the higher, more noble goal is that wise decisions will be made with the spatial perspective. Remember GIS being a thinker's tool, and the use of geotechnologies for a healthier, happier, more sustainable future.